We begin with the story of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem as told by Matthew in chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Listen for the word of the Lord. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd of spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, The whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Thus begins the story of Holy Week, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join with me as you are able in our call to worship. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
Let us confess our sins to God, whose steadfast love endures forever. O Lord, on this day you entered the beloved city that rejected you. We confess that our wills are rebellious, that our faith is often more show than substance, that our hearts are in need of cleansing. Have mercy on us, Son of David, Savior of our lives. Help us to lay at your feet all that we have and all that we are, trusting you to forgive what is sinful, to heal what is broken, to welcome our praises, and to receive us as your own. Amen. Let us to con continue to pray in silence. Amen. The Lord God helps us. We will not be disgraced. The Lord God helps us. Who can declare us guilty? Sisters and brothers, beyond the shadow of a doubt, our sins are forgiven. By the mercy of Christ, let us live as those forgiven and free. And since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God and stand in grace through Jesus Christ. May the peace of the Lord Jesus always be with you. I greet you in the grace and the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is great to have you as part of our virtual community this day. And if you are tuning in through the internet or checking this out sometime later in another format, uh, we are glad that you are here as we begin the Holy Week journey. Uh, please take note that our church building continues to be closed throughout this pandemic. However, our church is busy and active. So there are a couple things to call your attention to. One is to constantly check our website, fpccs.org. There you will find invitations to our Thursday Bible study. You'll find opportunities to share your prayer concerns and also general updates on what's going on in our faith community. Another thing to tell you, and it's kind of funny, is that uh, because of the pandemic, our palm branches are on a FedEx truck somewhere between Israel and Clark Summit. And should they ever appear, and should they be in good shape this week, uh, we will put them on both the outside doors, the lower door out back and the side door on, on School Street, and you are free to come back, to come by, to pick up some palm branches, to enjoy them or to share them. Again, welcome to this hour of worship. Uh, we will continue to convene this Thursday, Monday, Thursday at 7.30 for a service of Tenebrae and Communion. We invite you to, uh, to have handy your own bread and your own grape juice or wine that you might take part at your home. Good Friday, we will have a noontime service, a prayer service. And next Easter, next Sunday, uh, we will worship at 10 a.m. Again, welcome. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, source of all life. As we hear again the story of the passion, let the same mind be in us that was in Christ, who was a servant that we might be free. Awaken our ears, open our hearts, and sustain the weary with your word. Amen. A reading from Scripture comes from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 1, 4 through 9a words known to many as the ser third servant song. Listen as the servant speaks. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. 
The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Through the season of Lent, we have been turning to chapters 26 and 27 in the Gospel of Matthew as a way of understanding uh, the passion of Jesus and what it might have to say to all of us. So the passage I read today from Matthew 27, 15 to 25, in a way is the end parentheses around the passage we heard at the beginning of Holy Week. Listen. Now, at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner named Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who was called the Messiah? for he realized it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. And he asked, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted even more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. This is the name, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks. I have to tell you, it is an unusual Palm Sunday when children are not present. Palm Sunday is made for kids. This is the day that the church hands out props. Sometimes it's one of those spiky palm branches imported from Florida, ready for imagina imaginary lightsaber fights with your friends or for the benefit of poking your sister from behind. Children inhabit one of our favorite Palm Sunday songs, All Glory, Lot, and Honor to Thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children the sweet hosannas ring. In one account of the story, it is the children who squeal with delight when they see Jesus riding into the city on a little donkey. The grown-ups say to the Lord, get those children to be quiet, but he retorts, if these children were quiet, the stones would cry out. You see, the children recognize Jesus as one of their own. Uh, they see what's going on. They have deep insight. In fact, it is often a child who will ask, why does the crowd that loves Jesus on Sunday hate him by the end of the week? That's a good question. It's the question for today. Now, some would say, well, it's not the same crowd. Now, I wonder how they know that. Did they take attendance? So it's not the same crowd. Okay, well, multitudes are multitudes, and Passover was and still is the largest festival of the Jewish year. In the days of Jesus, the scholars tell us the population of Jerusalem multiplied one preacher from the state of Georgia says, we can estimate between 200,000 and a million people were in that city that week. That's quite an estimate, give or take 800,000. 
Suffice it to say, there were a lot of people in the city of Jerusalem. Every inn was full, every bed was taken, every lamb was purchased, every piece of unleavened bread was consumed. Passover is that important. And if you have that many people swelling into the city, it is logistically doubtful that the same people at the front end of the week would stick around to the very end of the week. Except that Matthew doesn't make that distinction. The Friday crowd has gathered for the Roman governor to release his customary Jewish prisoner as a, as a Passover public relations ploy. And the previous Sunday crowd welcomed Jesus as they sang from Psalm 118, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that's a Passover psalm. Say what we want, Matthew sees this as the same crowd, a Passover crowd. There is no segmenting this crowd from that crowd. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, the crowd is important. In this book, the word crowd comes up 48 different times. Wherever Jesus goes, there's always a crowd. According to Matthew, Jesus doesn't slip off by himself very much. Rather, he welcomes whomever is drawn to him. He gives himself to the whole assembly of the human family. And in one poignant moment of ministry, he has compassion on a large gathering of people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Which is to say, even for us in a season of social distancing, we are part of the crowd. The crowd is us. And yet, in this gospel writer's view, the very same people who welcome Jesus will turn on him five days later. Why do we suppose that is? Some would point out that crowds can be fickle. They change their minds. In the bottom of the fourth inning of a baseball game, they boo the pitcher who can't get it over the plate. But if that same player hits a home run with the bases loaded at the bottom of the ninth, they jump to their feet and cheer with a single voice. Were you ever part of a crowd like that? Of course you were. Crowds can take on a mind of their own. Every crowd has its own persona shaped by the setting and the circumstances. If you're enjoying a concert in a crowded auditorium and everybody is having a good time, the trajectory can build toward the finish and then the crowd leaps up as one for a standing ovation. Or recall the public rallies which seem all familiar these days or someone up front loudly picks a fight against opponents who aren't even in the room. And in such moments, facts do not matter. All that matters is ramping up the rhetoric, cranking up the energy, energizing the audience, and woe to the singular protester who dares to speak up and heckle. A person like that will get hurt, and the crowd will laugh. Does anybody wonder how a crowd could turn on Jesus? The psychologists tell us something even more. They call it the phenomenon of a mob mentality, noting that simply being part of a group changes how people think and behave. A few years ago, after a riot in Cologne, Germany, two social psychologists wrote, a group of people may behave in ways that violate the moral standards of each individual in that group, often leading to destructive behavior and brutality. Acting as part of a group can make individuals feel more anonymous and less responsibility for their actions, both of which promote aggression. Crowds may also change what constitutes seemingly appropriate behavior if everyone else is doing something, it seems justified or correct. And at the same time, 
perpetrators may knowingly commit wrongdoing to seek the approval of those around them. This sheds some light on how the Palm Sunday Hosannas can unravel into a unison cry on Friday to crucify. The crowd speaks as one. Together they shouted Hosanna. Together they shouted crucify. And no one dares to say otherwise. In fact, by Friday, Matthew says the religious leaders are actively agitating the crowds. And nobody, not Pontius Pilate nor Pilate's wife with her nightmare, could talk them out of it. And yet there's one more factor that needs to be noted. When a group of people are systematically mistreated, when they are demeaned, deprived, and put down in every way, should anyone be surprised if they rise up as one and push back, and then something goes askew? If the daily agitation that they feel is not released or processed in a constructive way, it can create more destruction. That was the situation in the time of Jesus. Jerusalem was occupied, heavily occupied, by soldiers from the Roman Empire. The empire rolled in with brute force. The people pushed back, an insurrection here, a demonstration there, and then the empire clamped down even harder. The city became a keg of dynamite, ready to explode, and that's why Pontius Pilate was there, to keep a lid on the Jewish Passover. Should anybody be surprised then that Jesus becomes the scapegoat? I was thinking about this and I began to remember the first church I served as a student pastor. It was located in Plainfield, New Jersey and one of the old timers was showing me around when I was still new and said, uh, do you know where you are? And without waiting for an answer he continued, you are standing on the front line of the Plainfield race riots. I looked around nervously and said, I don't see anybody. He said, no, no, it was 1967. He didn't say anything more, so I was curious to discover more of the story. It seems in 1967, the third of the population in Plainfield was African American. And most of those folks had moved there to raise their families, get along peaceably with their neighbors, and then commute to good jobs in Manhattan. But many of their neighbors wouldn't talk to them and weren't so sure about having them around and very few of those good paying jobs found their way to the African American third of the city. So the short version is that tensions ran high and anger simmered and fear and innuendo stoked the fire until one night, a Friday night, a fight broke out at the White Star Diner downtown. Words flew, fists flew, store windows were smashed, Police cars were called in. They were pelted by rocks. The situation caught fire. And then a white police officer took a shot at an African-American teenager. The mob turned on him, killing the officer with his own gun. It happened just like that because it had been happening for a very long time. And it took then three days of riots in Plainfield before the thing began to settle down. It was one of 167 riots that broke out during the hot, long, hot summer of 1967. And over 50 years later, the city is still largely broken and struggling to recover. All because some people had been oppressed so hard they could not stand and they wouldn't take it anymore, just like Jerusalem. And into this whole mess of humanity comes Jesus of Nazareth, son of God, human Messiah. He chooses to ride the little donkey. And those who remember the words of scripture then picture him as the humble king. Oh, they know he is powerful, he is authoritative, Yet he chooses to serve as one who is poor in spirit. The crowd cheers. They remember, they cry out Hosanna because they expect him to use his power 
to lift them up and free them from years of degradation. And instead, he just gives himself away. On the day of his sentencing, Pontius Pilate puts it to the crowd. As a Passover gift, he says rather magnanimously, uh, let me release one of my prisoners and give him back to you. Uh, there are two to choose from today. There is Jesus of Nazareth, and there is Jesus Barabbas. Now wait, you say. We've heard about Barabbas before. He is a violent man, a revolutionary. He killed somebody during one of those many insurrections. And his first name is Jesus? That's what Matthew's Gospel says. And not only that, the name Barabbas means son of the father. Bar, son, and Abbas or Abba is father. So Pilate's offer to the crowd is really this. You want Jesus Barabbas, son of the father? Or do you want Jesus the Christ, son of the father? You want the violent Jesus who considers killing somebody if it might change the world? Or do you want Jesus the humble king who comes to heal, restore, and teach us to forgive and love our enemies? This is the choice we are given. This is the choice that is still before us. My friends, we're in the midst of an unexpected pandemic. And one of the things we're discovering already is the invisible threat of illness reveals who we are. On the one hand, gun sales are setting records and some would deem the self-defense industry as essential. And on the other hand, we have people in our own church who are stitching up face masks to protect caregivers from getting infections. There it is, again, the same choice. Do we give in to the seduction of violence or do we engage in the hard work of healing? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus the Messiah? The tragedy of Holy Week is that for whatever reason, the crowd of that time who acclaimed Jesus on Sunday made the wrong decision on Friday. They let their anxiety get the best of them. But the good news is that God anticipated this from the beginning, for God knows who we are. The crowd who has no shepherd does, in fact, have a good shepherd who lays down his life for them. And in the grand sweep of this coming week, from Palm Sunday to Good Friday to Easter, God raises Jesus to come back with mercy and compassion and grace and say once again to the crowd, can we try this again? There is another way to live. And we have heard Jesus teach it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those hungry and thirsty for righteousness, even if they're persecuted for doing the right thing. Blessed are the merciful and the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. And blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord.
Let us affirm our faith with one of the early confessions of the church from the second chapter of Philippians. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This day, let us make our morning prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, remember us when you come into your kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. For your church around the world, we ask new life. Your kingdom come, your will be done. For all who carry out ministries of service in your name, we ask grace and wisdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done. For all who in this season have accepted spiritual disciplines, we ask inspired discipleship. Your kingdom come, your will be done. For Christians in every land, we ask new unity in your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. For those who cannot believe, we ask your faithful love. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Governors and rulers of every land, we ask your guidance. Your kingdom come, your will be done. For people who suffer and sorrow, we ask your healing and your peace. This day we pray for Bob and Linda, for the Wydean family, for Janice and for Shawnee, for Warren, for Jack and Diane, for Grover and Nancy, Joan and Bob, and our co-workers, for Lauren and for Ona, for Robin, Fran and Jenna, and Pat, Bruce and Randy, for Ben and Mary, and for Little Hall. And we pray for Brian and all other residents of the Jewish home where there is now one known case of the deadly virus. Come and heal and come to those whose names we lift before you in the privacy of our hearts. God of love, as in Jesus Christ you gave yourself to us, so may we give ourselves to you, living according to your holy will. Keep our feet firmly in the way where Christ leads us. Make our mouths speak the truth that Christ teaches us. Fill our bodies and souls with the life that is Christ within us. And hear us as we pray as he teaches. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, what Christ offers this week is his life. We will taste it in broken bread and poured out cup, but we will live it as the power of his cross is worked out within us in our service. So let us give of ourselves freely, particularly to those in special need. And let me call you to special attention for the one great hour of sharing special offering during this season. If you are able to send in a donation for one great hour sharing or to go to our website, fpccs.org, uh, to provide for the needs of those who are in the most extreme circumstances, they are providing grants for caregivers and health workers and for churches who are afflicted by this virus. So we help others through our generosity. So let us give as Christ gives. Let us pray. Holy God, we give ourselves to you, for you have first loved us. We thank you for all the mercy shown to us in Christ, and we give ourselves to show that mercy to one another. 
Bless us in this holiest of weeks, we ask. Through Jesus, the Messiah, the humble King. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.